the whole month of March, we have uh, events prepared for you on research transparency. And today we're going to start with um, kind of a, a, a research that set the stage to the whole campaign, hopefully. So I'm going to introduce myself first. So my name is Liz Guzman Ramirez and I'm the research data steward for RSM and ESE. So I support all the researchers and today helping me or help with organization of this event is uh, Antonio Schettino and Mutaleni Nadimi and they both are from RS, or ER, ERS, so the Erasmus Research Services and the library. So this whole event is together with ERIM, the library and the Erasmus Research Services. So we welcome all your questions in the chat or you can also at the end of the session raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask the questions, whatever feels better for you. Um, and OK, so we're going to start with a few words and introductory words from Enrico. So Professor Enrico Pennings is the research director of Erasmus uh, School of Economics, um, also part of ERIM. And he's also a practitioner of open science, so we're happy to have you here in this in this introductory session. And then he will lead us to the speaker of the session today, this is Professor Mike Rubin. So Enrico, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Liz. So I'm very proud that I could do the uh, closing ceremony of the uh, ARM uh, October Data Fest. And I can now do the uh, uh, opening ceremony of this already uh, third ARM uh, campaign on research transparency. It's also nice to see that uh, the ARM open science uh, campaigns are organically growing and are now accessible to all researchers from uh, Erasmus uh, University. And it's also great that the open science movement at uh, Erasmus is taking off with task forces at uh, the faculty level at uh, Erasmus School of Economics, but also at uh, the university level headed uh, by Percy Huygens. So when I look at the topic of uh, this opening ceremony, uh, pre-registration as part of uh, research transparency, I feel a bit embarrassed, embarrassed because I've never pre-registered any of my research. Uh, Probably this is to do with my research field, which is uh, applied industrial organization, where we mostly work with firm data, which are well accessible. Uh, and most pressing issues from an open science perspective in my field is to make the data and statistical codes accessible to other researchers. So pre-registration seems more common in psychology research and behavioral economics draws upon insights from psychology and is more experimental. So within, say, the field of economics and behavioral economics, pre-registration seems uh, more common than in my field of uh, economics. So when thinking about pre-registration, so I also thought of uh, the results of a recent uh, mega project by uh, Bert Mengfeld and hundreds of colleagues in finance. So they all got the same sample and they were asked to test the same hypothesis on this uh, same sample. So even there, uh, the outcomes were very different and sizable. As for example, researchers uh, made different choices with respect to how to treat outliers. And of course, you cannot capture anything, everything in such a pre-registration. So when I look at what pre-registration tries to prevent, I must admit that my hypotheses have often changed when research progressed. And also my regressions have changed by including control variables or my data have, have changed because I included more recent years. And also referees actually, or editors, press me to change my hypothesis, right? So this, I've always thought of this as a kind of learning on a job and be responsive to new insights and say, I gradually update the quality of my research. But what I do know is that there must be many great ideas that have been researched several times because they sound great from a theory perspective, but for which in the end, there is simply no empirical evidence. And probably would be good that such a study will be published even without the statistical evidence. So especially for experiments where subjects are not listed firms who openly disclose data, but are individuals who participate in an experiment and where N is not fixed, I see the, the, the merit of pre-registration. Anyway, the title of our main talk of today is not conclusive, but it's a rather a question. So the question is, uh, does does pre-registration improve interpretability and credibility of research findings? So I'm very glad that for addressing this question, we have an expert in this field, Mark Rubin, so who is a professor in psychology at Durham University. 
So I just learned that this is his first day at uh, Durham University. So he was at the University of Newcastle in Australia before. And actually, he's still in Australia, so it's uh, very late for him at the moment. But I'm very happy that uh, I can give uh, the floor to you or the virtual floor to you, Mark. And we're very curious to learn more about this subject. Thank you very much. OK, I will. Let me try and get this going. OK, <clears throat> thank you very much, Enrico, and um, thank you, Antonio and Liz and Mutileni for inviting me to talk today. Uh, I'm sure you'll all agree. Thanks for all coming. And I'm sure you'll agree that they put together a really great month of presentations. And I'm very honoured to be invited to um, make the opening presentation. In fact, to be honest, I was a little bit surprised to be invited. Um, I'm actually, as you know, quite critical of one particular open science practice, which is pre-registration. So why should I be asked to speak here? Well, I've had some discussions with the organizing committee and they were very clear to me that they wanted me to share my critical thoughts on pre-registration today. And I realized that this approach is entirely consistent with the core principles of open science. So for example, Here's the guiding principles of Rotterdam's own open science community. And they say that op the open science communities promote critical discussions of pros and cons of open science scholarship practices. We refrain from being normative or condescending and do not tell others what to do. Respect for each other's workflows and decisions in this regard is critical. So I think it makes perfect sense for a critic like me to be involved in these discussions. But don't worry, there's plenty of opportunity to hear pro pre-registration views in the subsequent talks. Um, now, before I start, I do want to make it clear that I actually endorse many open science practices. Um, so, for example, I share my research data, materials, my syntax code and so on for my projects. Um, in addition, although I'm critical of pre-registration, I'm also, also aware that my views could be wrong, or at least based on an unpopular perspective. And even if my views are right, I need to follow community norms. So I also pre-register a lot of my research, and I encourage my students and colleagues to do so as well. And all of this is really just to show that I'm not a complete heretic. <laughs> Um, that I do have some personal experience of open science practices, including pre-registration. Um, I also wanted to highlight a few of the papers that I've published in this area um, because I'll be using arguments from them today. So especially that first one there on pre-registration, which I think is, is why I'm here. Um, and if you're interested in these articles, you can find open access versions of them on my website. You just search for Mark Rubin, Google Sites, and it should pop up. And I also wanted to acknowledge that my ideas have been inspired by several others in this area, including the work of Bernard Davizer, uh, Daniel Navarro, Abba Salozzi, and Chris Donkin and their colleagues. So again, I, I would recommend those papers there if you're interested in a more critical perspective on pre-registration. Perhaps we need to start off with a definition of what pre-registration is, the basics, the nuts and bolts. Um, essentially, um, it involves the registration of planned research hypotheses, methods and analyses in a timestamp document before data analysis occurs. And that document is then made available with the research report to allow reviewers and readers to identify discrepancies between what was planned and what was actually done. So I will be uh, addressing a claim about pre-registration that was put forward by Brian Nozick and colleagues, and it's that pre-registration improves the interpretability and credibility of research findings. Now, I actually agree with that claim, but only if no other open science practices are in place. If other open science practices are in place, then I think this claim is a bit misleading. So 
here's the counterclaim that I'll be making today, and it's that pre-registration does not improve the interpretability and credibility of research findings. When researchers provide a rationales for the current hypotheses and analytical approaches, uh, B, publicly available research data, materials and code, and C, demonstrations of the robustness of research conclusions to alternative interpretations and analytical approaches. And these are some of the issues that I'll be addressing today. Basically, my argument will be that in some cases, pre-registration reveals information that doesn't affect research credibility, such as harking. And in other cases, other open science practices are sufficient to reveal information that does affect research credibility, such as p-hacking. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Let's get stuck in with the consideration of that first issue there on the list, which is the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory analyses. So Simmons et al. explained that pre-registration allows readers to distinguish unplanned exploratory analyses from planned confirmatory analyses. The problem with that justification it is there's a lot of confusion over what's meant by confirmatory and exploratory analyses and why that distinction is useful. Let me give you some potential definitions and some problems with those definitions. So let's start at the top of this table. Um, if confirmatory and exploratory analyses refer to hypothesis testing and descriptive research respectively, then does that mean that we can describe hypothesis testing as confirmatory, even if it's post hoc? And I think most people would say no. So there's a problem with the way we, we define it there. Some people would say that uh, confirmatory analyses are independent from the current results and exploratory analyses are based on the current results. But then what happens if we pre-register an analysis that's based on the current results? So, for example, we might pre-register that we'll drop items from a scale if they reduce that scale's reliability. Now, even though this approach is pre-registered, shouldn't we call it exploratory? Because the scale items that we use in our analyses will depend on the results of our reliability analysis. Uh, and some people Oops, oh, sorry, I just lost the thing. Let me get rid of that. Yeah, some people say that confirmatory and exploratory analyses refer to strong and weak theory, respectively. But then presumably that means that even pre-registered hypothesis tests should be described as exploratory when they're based on weak theory and loose derivation chains. What about Simmons et al's idea that confirmatory and exploratory analyses refer to planned and unplanned analyses respectively? The problem here is that planning to undertake an exploratory analysis doesn't necessarily make that analysis confirmatory. For example, planning to undertake an exploratory factor analysis doesn't turn that into a confirmatory factor analysis. Maybe confirmatory and exploratory analyses refer to a priori and post hoc predictions or predictions and post predictions, as they're sometimes called. But can we really call a prediction confirmatory if it's just a random guess that has no theoretical basis? What's being confirmed here exactly? And finally, some people link confirmatory and exploratory research to hypothesis testing and hypothesis generation, respectively. But what happens if we view our results and then retrieve a previously generated hypothesis to explain them? Does that count as hypothesis generation or hypothesis testing? So things get a bit confusing here. Basically, pre-registration is supposed to provide a clearer distinction between confirmatory and exploratory research. But when you start to pick at that distinction, it kind of falls apart in your hands. And from what I can see, pre-registration doesn't really help to make it any clearer. OK, so let's have a look at um, that last issue of hypothesis testing and hypothesis generation, because it's related to the issue of harking or hypothesizing after the results are known.
Now, as Nozick and colleagues have pointed out, harking is potentially problematic because post hoc theorizing sometimes leads to circular reasoning in which the same result is used twice. Once as part of a theoretical rationale for a hypothesis, and then a second time to provide support for that hypothesis. In other words, the same result is used to both generate and test the hypothesis. And I totally agree that that kind of double use of the same result is problematic. However, where I disagree is that harking prevents you from identifying that circular reasoning. I would argue that you don't need to know the true timing of a researcher's reasoning to know whether or not that reasoning is circular. You just need to look at the contents of that reasoning. Let me give you uh, an example. So imagine that a researcher tells you that they predicted that eating apples improves mood. But unbeknownst to you, they secretly harked that hypothesis after observing that eating apples improve the mood of participants in their study. Now imagine that the researcher provides the following theoretical rationale for their secretly harked hypothesis. They say, look, vitamin C, it improves mood. And apples are rich in vitamin C. Therefore, we can predict that eating apples should improve mood. In that case, we can clearly see that their current result, eating apples improves mood, has not been used in either of the two premises that comprise the formal deduction of their hypothesis. Consequently, we can confirm that there's no circular reasoning in using, uh, that's been used to support that hypothesis. And again, my point here is that we don't need pre-registration to see this. We just need to look at the formal theoretical rationale, look at its contents rather than its timing, and check that its premises don't refer to the current result. But what about inspiration and motivated and biased reasoning? For example, our researcher was inspired. It was inspired by their finding that eating apples improves mood. So isn't that a problem? Well, no, I don't think it is. I think it's perfectly fine for a result to inspire a hypothesis and for all sorts of ulterior motives like the need to get published to make researchers search for a suitable theoretical rationale. According to the logic of hypothesis testing, all we need to do to avoid the fallacy of circular reasoning is to make sure that the current result is not used as a premise in the formal theoretical rationale. And a researcher's personal inspiration and motivation aren't included in the formal theoretical rationale. And so they don't compromise what John Worrell calls the epistemic independence between the rationale and the test results. Uh, more generally, I think it's important to appreciate that motivated and biased reasoning doesn't imply incorrect reasoning or invalid reasoning or even unsound reasoning. And you don't need pre-registration to identify incorrect, invalid or unsound reasoning. So, for example, if I predict that apples improve mood because bananas are yellow, then you don't need pre-registration to appreciate that my reasoning is, is flawed, it's invalid. I also want to point out that in some cases, motivated reasoning and biases can actually facilitate scientific pro progress. Let me give you two examples. So the confirmation bias is a tendency for researchers to interpret evidence as confirming their hypotheses. But importantly, this bias is stronger when researchers view hypotheses as being more plausible. So actually facilitate scientific pro progress by preventing well-established, highly plausible theories from being disconfirmed too easily. For example, it's functional for scientists to have a confirmation bias towards the theory of evolution relative to creationist accounts. And the hindsight bias is the tendency for researchers to fool themselves into believing that they predicted a result after they became aware of that result. 
So researchers may fool themselves into believing that they haven't changed their beliefs about hypothesis because they knew it all along. But the hindsight bias doesn't prevent researchers or readers from actually changing their mind about a hypothesis. It only obscures this attitude change from their conscious awareness. So researchers may unconsciously update their belief about a hypothesis, even if they fool themselves into believing that they knew it all along. So again, the hindsight bias is functional because it prevents scientists' need for self-consistency from obstructing scientific progress. Uh, another concern is that researchers who hark will only ever confirm hypotheses and never disconfirm them. But as Norbert Kerr, who's the, the guy who sort of uh, developed this idea of harking, as Norbert Kerr suggested, this isn't true. So researchers can hark disconfirmed hypotheses just as much as they could hark confirmed hypotheses. For example, a researcher might find that eating apples improves mood, and then they might hark two competing hypotheses one that's consistent with their result and one that's disconfirmed by the result. And they might do that because they want to provide a competitive test between those two hypotheses. So it's not true that harking always leads to confirmations. What about overfitting? So another common concern is that harking may lead to overfitting. What is it? It occurs when researchers construct a hypothesis on the basis of results from a specific sample, but they accidentally accommodate the idiosyncratic and unrepresentative properties of that sample in their hypothesis. So the hypothesis provides a better fit to that particular sample than it does to the population that it's supposed to represent. And confirmatory hypothesis testing is supposed to avoid overfitting by preventing researchers from changing their hypothesis in response to the results. But it may also lead to underfitting. In particular, it may prevent researchers from confirming an unplanned hypothesis that produces a better fit with the population. Uh, Protsko gave a nice example in which a researcher fits a pre-registered linear model to a curvilinear so association and then confirms that with a significant result. However, in this case, the confirmatory linear model is underfitting the actual pattern of data. And an unplanned curvy linear model would have avoided this. So that's underfitting. Uh, staying with harking, and I will move on from harking in a minute, but I uh, just want to get some of these issues out of the way. Another concern is that Harking can be used to predict nearly any pattern of results in nearly any context, as Kerr says. I don't deny that. It's absolutely true. But I see that as an advantage of post-hoc theorising rather than a disadvantage because it increases our ability to explain our results. Now, just like a priori theorising, post-hoc theorising may be good, average or terrible but we don't need pre-registration to make those evaluations. Furthermore, the quality of post-hoc theorizing, sh theorizing should be taken into account in a process of inference to the best explanation. So the question isn't whether a researcher can provide a post-hoc explanation of their results, because most researchers can cobble together an explanation that predicts their results. You know, it doesn't take much. The real question is, how good is that explanation relative to other potential explanations? And I think this is the important point that a lot of the, the theory first pre-registration skeptics have been trying to get across. Um, another potential benefit of pre-registration is that it allows you to identify a priori hypotheses that would otherwise be suppressed in non-pre-registered studies perhaps because they yielded null results. But this potential benefit fails to distinguish between relevant and irrelevant hypotheses. If a suppressed a priori hypothesis is irrelevant to the final research conclusions, then by definition, its suppression won't bias those conclusions. And if a suppressed a priori hypothesis is relevant to the final conclusions, then 
people are likely to bring it up as an alternative explanation during either pre or post publication peer review. I mean, if it's relevant, then surely other people will notice that. So pre-registration isn't necessary to identify uh, relevant hypotheses. And the final thing with Harkin, I think. Um, what about the ethics of Harkin? So Harkin is widely acknowledged to fall into an ethical gray area. Even Norbert Kerr, who coined the term, conceded that Harkin is not necessarily unethical. As he explains, Harking can entail concealment. The question then becomes whether what is concealed in Harking can be a useful part of the truth or is instead basically uninformative and may therefore be safely ignored at the author's discretion. And I think to answer that question, we need to consider whether hypotheses are generated by people or by theories. Now, if hypotheses are generated by people, then the time at which a specific person generates a hypothesis, I think it is a useful part of the truth. And hiding that information by harking, I think is unethical. However, if like me, you think that hypotheses are generated by theories rather than by people, then the time at which a hypothesis is deduced from a theory doesn't form a useful part of the truth because the consequence of a logical deduction doesn't change over time. For example, the soundness and validity of the deduction that vitamin C improves mood and apples are rich in vitamin C, therefore eating apples will improve mood, doesn't change depending on whether or not it's made before or after we obtain evidence for that hypothesis. Furthermore, if you think that hypotheses are deduced from theories rather than from people, then it's not deceptive to say as predicted by theory X, even when that prediction is deduced after a relevant result becomes known, because the prediction refers to a timeless theoretical deduction rather than a specific person's prophecy about the future. To be clear, I am not suggesting that it is okay to lie in research reports or elsewhere, because in general, lying is wrong, okay? Instead, my point is that the temporal information that's concealed by Harking is only important if you're testing people's personal prophecies about the future. It's not important if you're testing theoretically deduced hypotheses. Okay, enough with the Harking. So let's move on from Harking and consider some other issues and, and we'll move to stuff about data analysis. Um, so as uh, Brian Nozick and colleagues explained, pre-registration is useful because it allows you to know how many statistical tests you plan to conduct. And so it en enables the computation of an accurate family-wise error rate for your study. But this study-wise error rate is only relevant if you're testing a joint study-wise hypothesis that you'd accept if you found at least one significant result in your study. The problem, I think, with that is that researchers are not usually interested in testing study-wise hypotheses because they're not usually theoretically meaningful. Let me give you an example. Um, imagine that a researcher conducts a study in which they explore the associations between weight and gender and age and social class. This researcher is unlikely to be interested in testing a study-wise hypothesis that they'd accept following at least one significant result in their study, because this study-wise hypothesis is unlikely to relate to a meaningful theory. For example, which theory pro would propose that gender and age and social class all predict weight and for the same theoretical reason. None that I know of. And if a researcher isn't interested in making a decision about this study-wise hypothesis, then there's no need for them to be concerned about the associated study-wise error rates. So it's more common for researchers to define their families of tests to generate this family-wise error rate based on 
theoretical concerns rather than because their tests happen to be part of the same study. And in this case, pre-registration isn't needed to establish which tests belong to which families because the theory already does that for us. So for example, if a researcher is prepared to accept a single significant gender difference on one of four measures of weight as evidence for a gender difference in weight, then we don't need pre-registration to know that their family-wise error rate should refer to these four tests and not, for example, to tests of age differences in height that also happen to occur in the same study. And if we're suspicious that the researcher may have excluded a fifth measure of weight from their report, then we can check their research materials and data for any evidence of this additional measure. Um, there's also the claim that pre-registration helps to uncover and or reduce p-hacking and selective reporting. But pre-registration isn't necessary to uncover p-hacking and selective reporting, other open science practices can work just as well. So, for example, if a significant result is obtained after excluding outliers, then a robustness analysis can help to rule out p-hacking by demonstrating that the results remain significant after including outliers. In fact, even if a researcher pre-registered that they would exclude outliers, I would still want to see a robustness analysis to find out what happens when you include those outliers. Um, basically, robustness analyses and their big brother, multiverse, multiverse analyses, I think are a much better way of revealing both intentional and unintentional p-hacking. And if a researcher doesn't provide a robustness analysis, then you can, you know, if they provide publicly available data, you can delve in and have a go yourself. So again, other open science practices uh, I think are better than pre-registration in that sense. Another potential problem with p-hacking is that it is supposed to invalidate your p-values. As Simmons et al. explained in their classic paper on the subject, the problem is that the likelihood of at least one of many analyses producing a falsely positive finding at the 5% level is necessarily greater than 5%. Simmons statement is perfectly correct. However, again, in my view, they're referring to the wrong error rate. They're referring to a study-wise error rate rather than an individual error rate. And a study-wise error rate is only relevant if you're testing a study-wise hypothesis that you would accept if at least one of the results in your study is significant. If, on the other hand, you're testing individual hypotheses, then the 5% individual error rate is appropriate and it doesn't become inflated when you conduct lots and lots of individual tests. Let me give you an example. So let's take Munro's famous jelly bean example here. Um, in this case, the joint hypothesis would be that jelly beans of one or more colors cause acne. And in this case, an alpha adjustment would definitely be needed if we were to make that sort of claim based on at least one significant result from among the 20 tests that have been conducted here. However, the researchers actually end up making a much more specific claim that green jelly beans cause acne. As you can see, this claim is only supported by a single significance test, not multiple tests. And so it doesn't require an alpha adjustment. In short, it's not the number of significance tests that you perform in your study that matters. It's the ratio of tests to decisions that matter. And here, only one test is used to decide that green jelly beans, green jelly beans, cause acne. Um, Pre-registration has also been promoted as a method of dealing with what Gelman and Locken describe as the garden of forking paths. Basically, this issue is one of results contingent decision making during data analysis. For example, a researcher might decide to include a variable as a covariate in a test because it's significantly correlated with their outcome variable. In this case, 
and replication of that decision rule in future studies would mean that the researcher would include the variable as a covariate when it's in when it's correlated with the outcome, but they would exclude it when it's not correlated with the outcome. So in a long run of tests conducted on many different samples, we'd end up with two tests of the same hypothesis, one with the covariate and one without it. And we would need to adjust our alpha level in order to take this, what Gelman and Lockman call invisible multiplicity into account. Uh, critically, forking paths don't need to be pre-registered to be identified. This is something that Gelman and Lockman themselves pointed out. For example, if a researcher explains that a variable was included as a covariate in their test because it was significantly correlated with their outcome variable, then it's clear that they've undertaken a results contingent test. And you can you know, see that there are forking paths there and you can adjust the alpha level accordingly. A Bonferroni test would divide by two. But the more fundamental issue here is that forking path problems, uh, the forking path problem assumes that we're interested in an unconditional inference that applies across the forking paths in our analysis. However, instead, we may be interested in making a conditional inference that only applies to the single path that we discuss in our report. For example, if a researcher decides to include a variable as a covariate in their analysis because it's correlated with their outcome, then their conditional inference would be about a long run of replications that always includes the variable as a covariate and never excludes it. In that case, there's no multiple testing in the long run, and so no invisible multiplicity to worry about. So we have to wonder, you know, what kind of inference are you making, conditional or unconditional? Uh, what about optional stopping? So optional stopping occurs when researchers repeat the same test at different stages of their data collection until they obtain a significant result. And pre-registration is supposed to identify optional stopping by comparing a researcher's final sample size with their pre-registered sample size. And I will just make two points about this. First of all, the seriousness of optional stopping depends on your inferential approach. In particular, optional stopping isn't problematic for neo fisherians or many Bayesians because they don't use decision thresh thresholds or at least not formally. And so there's no error rates for them to inflate. Second, the practice of continually adding more participants and testing until you get a significant result doesn't guarantee that you'll get a significant result in the right direction. So for example, I might keep adding more and more participants to my sample until bingo, I get a significant result. But that significant result might disconfirm my hypothesis rather than confirm it. So testing until significant doesn't result into doesn't result in sampling to a foregone conclusion when the conclusion is that the result either supports or contradicts a directional hypothesis. Um, Pre-registration has also been proposed to facilitate an evaluation of the severity of a test. Um, According to Deborah Mayo, a test is severe if it has a low probability of confirming a hypothesis when that hypothesis is false. For example, a severe pregnancy test would be one in which a pregnancy is only confirmed if 10 different pregnancy tests all yield positive results. It's unlikely to be wrong. Uh, Daniel Lakins has argued that things like harking selective reporting and optional stopping all reduce the severity of tests and pre-registration facilitates an evaluation of severity by helping to identify these questionable research practices. But this argument assumes that these, these questionable research practices are problematic and that pre-registration <coughs> pre is needed to detect them. As I hope I've shown today, harking and optional stopping are not necessarily problematic, and p-hacking or selective reporting 
can be identified through other open science practices, such as robustness analyses and publicly available research materials and data. It's also important to note here that pre-registration isn't necessary to evaluate severity. So for example, you don't need pre-registration to know that getting 10 positive results on 10 independent pregnancy tests represents a severe test for pregnancy. You just need to be able to check that there aren't any unreported negative results and open data and materials allow you to do that. Uh, Daniel Lakins uh, agrees that pre-registration isn't necessary to evaluate severity. As he explains, sometimes it's possible to evaluate the severity of a test if the study was not pre-registered. He gives an example of a study where there's no room for bias because the analyses are perfectly constrained by theory. But if it's possible to evaluate the severity of a non-pre-registered test as being high when the theory provides no room for bias, then why isn't it possible to evaluate the severity of a non-pre-registered test as being low when a theory provides lots of room for bias. Uh, Daniel will be presenting here on Thursday and I would encourage you to attend his talk because although I'm a bit critical of his position, I think he provides a very thoughtful and nuanced take on the value of pre-registration. And finally, pre-registration and especially registered reports also help to increase the reporting of null findings. But I would ask, is that really a benefit? Again, I think that the answer to that question depends on your inferential approach and perhaps what goals you have as well. So if you're using a Bayesian test, then a Bayes factor close to one may be regarded by some people as barely worth mentioning. So if you skip it, you know, nothing, not too much is lost. Similarly, if you're using a, a Fisherian test, then a null result represents the absence of evidence, and it can be ignored from the perspective of hypothesis testing, basic hypothesis testing. If you're using a Neyman Pearson test in which you may either accept or reject or decide to remain in doubt about a hypothesis, then failing to report a test, a result that's left you in doubt, won't bias your decision making. I mean, if you decide to remain in doubt, then that's not going to push you one way or the other. So again, failing to report that doesn't really bias the decisions you've made. Finally, even if you're using a simple accept or reject name and Pearson test, then a null result will be pretty uninformative if you concede that that test has got unacceptably low power. So a reporting bias against null results I think is really only problematic for a very simple version of the name and Pearson test when you've got high power. And even in that case, you can never really have sufficiently high power to find uh, conclusively an effect size of zero. Um, OK, so I've criticised some of the potential pros of pre-registration. But I think it's also important to consider some of the potential cons. Um, and one big con, I think, is what I've called the pre-registration commitment bias. Um, so essentially, I think that there are a number of biases uh, that may make researchers more committed to their pre-registered hypotheses and analyses. And I think that can be problematic if their unplanned hypotheses and analyses turn out to be better because they will be biased against these better unplanned hypotheses and analyses and biased towards these worse hypotheses simply because they've been pre-registered. So what, what are these biases? I think um, uh, one is called an automation bias. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, one's called an automation bias and a planned continuation bias. And these may lead researchers to stick to their pre-registered plan when a different approach is more appropriate. There's also something called the first is best bias, which may make people view their first ideas, in other words, their a priori hypotheses, as being their best ideas, 
at the expense of other potentially better postdoc hypotheses. So in summary, the pre-registration of a research plan may increase researchers' commitment to that plan and bias them against testing alternative post hoc predictions and hypotheses that may actually provide better explanations of their results. Now, I'm not alone in that, that, that point, by the way, um, that the classic paper pre-registration is redundant at best. The at best refers to this kind of issue, that there is a danger in people relying too heavily on pre-registration as a, a heuristic for quality, and they may get trapped into um, this idea when other ideas, non-pre-registered ideas, may be much better. So, um, in summary then, my argument is that in some cases, pre-registration reveals information that doesn't affect research credibility, such as harking or theoretically meaningless study-wise error rates. And in other cases, other open science practices are sufficient to reveal information that does affect research credibility, such as p-hacking and selective reporting. Again, from my perspective, pre-registration may be useful if other open science practices are unavailable. But, and it's a big but, I think it provides a relatively narrow researcher-centric form of historical transparency that may have a problem in that it biases researchers in favour of their planned hypotheses and analyses. So I think it's only really useful if you are interested in what people predict rather than in what theories predict. In contrast, other open science practices allow research data to be analysed and interpreted from multiple unplanned theoretical and analytical perspectives and that kind of probative approach can actually increase the credibility and severity of your research conclusions. So in my view, we should focus less on pre-registration and more on those other open science practices. OK, that is it from me. Thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions and how do I see people? <laughs> yeah, thank, you. thank you so much. Thanks a lot. You can, you can if you want. If you want. Sorry. Stop sharing. Stop your sharing. Screen. Your screen. Ah, OK. Um, I've, I've got a few other slides that um, I might oh, refer oh, to during the question. Is that all right if I just keep it on for a sec? Yeah, of course, yeah, of, course. of course, of course. Thank That's you. perfectly fine. Yeah, um, no problem. So there is a question in the chat um, and I do have more questions also. Um, so Julia, do you want me to ask you a question? Do you want to ask it yourself? Um, I can also ask it myself. <laughs> so it, it's Thank fine. you. Yeah, great. Um, so thanks for the interesting presentation. I, I do have a quick question because uh, while I understand that pre-registration is not necessarily needed for so, for identifying some of the of the bad practices, so to say, but it seems to me that it is it helps to identify them faster. If I look at the review process, for example, if I review a paper, of course I can look into the material, into the data, and I can I can figure out what, what people did, basically. And I can also figure out if, if there is some kind of weird argumentation around how, how people formulate certain things. But it seems to me that in addition to that, it might be just faster if I look at a one-page pre-registration where all the hypotheses are in and a bit of a summary what the research was about. Mm. And a second point is, it seems that the view on pre-registration is relatively dogmatic in a sense that I think pre-registration does not need to be the final verdict of what is going to be in the paper. So for me, it's rather like an additional tool to what we have to speed up a bit to, mm. to find malpractices. But it's not that I have to stick to everything. If I add to my paper, well, we did those analyses ex post because we found out that some of the things were just not doable or, or other analyses were better. So I think it's just, and I see it more as an add-on, and I would like to see your, your point on that. Yeah, I mean, in terms of identifying things quickly, um, I think that what you're able to do with pre-registration is to identify deviations from a planned analysis quickly, right? Um, and I, I am not personally that interested in those deviations. 
because the plan itself may not be very good. So why should we be interested in deviations from a plan which itself may be not a very good plan? I am more interested in deviations from high quality theories and analyses. Um, and, and I think that that, you know, so I, I, I've got a, a ton of slides that I, I kind of overshot on this um, on this presentation and I've got a ton of slides. So if you bear with me, um, I can just present this one because it's something I talk about in the paper, um, which is this idea that, um, you know, I, I quickly identifying, like you say, Julia, um, deviations and, and pre, I agree pre-registration does allow you to very quickly identify deviations. But my answer, my response to, be, to that would be, is that useful? Um, so imagine that a researcher pre-registers test A, but then decides to use test B instead. Like we say, we can quickly figure that out. But I think we should be interested in, in the researcher's rationale for using test B, rather than in their rationale for changing from test A to test B. In other words, we should be interested in the rationale for test B, rather than in the rationale for deviating from a pre-registered plan, which may be uh, biased in itself, right? So as a reviewer, when I, when I see things and I think mm, that's good or that's bad, this will be based on, on comparing what is being done to theoretical um, high quality theory and also you know, analytical conventions. It won't necessarily be by comparing with what they plan to do because I don't really care too much about what they plan to do. I care about what they did and whether or not what they did is is good quality compared to uh, what's going on. Now, I, I've immediately forgotten your second point of that question. Sorry, Julie, could you just remind me? Yeah, I think to add to what you've just said, I think I probably had a bit of a too extreme case in mind because I thought about I'm a behavioral uh, economist, so I do experiments basically. And sometimes it can happen that people ex post, I mean, I, these are very extreme cases, take a control variable, find that it's significant somehow, and then manufacture a bit of, of, of a story around, um, around it, that this is what they it, it had in mind. And I'm not saying this is bad it, per se to have an outcome based on such a thing, but it is slightly problematic to my uh, view. And that, that is a bit the extreme case, and I acknowledge that it's an extreme case, but it also adds to the point that I'm, I made before the second question so that I think the view on pre-registration is maybe a bit too strong in the sense that that it it assumes that pre-registration really determines everything from the beginning to the end of of, of a finally published paper but yeah. in my view pre-registration is just an add-on that I can use as as another tool to identify practices that are maybe unethical to a certain extent so I don't have to stick to my pre-registration as long as I have very good reasons that I can outline in the paper, which is also visible here. That was necessary. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I would take that opportunity to just give you another one of my slides, <laughs> which is um, which is kind of it reminds what you're saying reminds me of this sort of slogan that pre-registration advocates put forward, and it's a useful slogan. It, you know, it, it does push home the point that. You can have a pre-registration. You don't need to stick to it, like you're saying. Um, but I do think there is a danger with this, uh, with the way things are done here, because yes, you don't need to stick to your pre-registration. But I think you might find that if you deviate from your pre-registration, there'll be a kind of a, a feeling amongst reviewers and editors that you shouldn't have done that, really. <laughs> you know, and, and and the reason that comes across is because. If you stick to your registration, you're being good. You, you're being confirmatory. You haven't deviated. You know, you haven't changed your plan, and, and everything's hunky dory. Whereas if you deviate slightly from your pre-registration, then you've gone off the path. You become exploratory, and as an explore, and I understand that exploratory research is regarded as fine, but it doesn't have the same status as confirmatory research. Suddenly, um, your results become tentative. They can't be headline news in your article. They can't go in your abstracts. Um, you know, they're not as important as confirmatory analyses. Um, and so there is this devaluation, I think, that takes place uh, when you deviate. And so I, I think that, you know, 
and, and it's fine. You know, if you want, if you want to use DBA um, pre-registration to sort of check what's happened and see what's what's gone on, that's fine. But I'm just taking a step back and saying, why do we want to do that, and what are the repercussions of that, and how do we then evaluate research that has deviated, that is exploratory, and is therefore less credible, or some would say gets the credibility that it deserves. But then I would say, is that credibility then less than uh, what we are giving to confirmatory research? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to quickly ask you one question that we're asking all our presenters. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're going to run out of time very, very shortly. If you had to choose one open science practice that is necessary to ensure transparency, what would it be? I have a slide. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, so my my answer is that I think it is very important, and this is kind of a theme that, that I picked up on a little bit throughout the talk. I think it's important to distinguish between relevant and irrelevant transparency. Um, and it's not only important to ensure transparency about relevant information, but we also don't want to have transparency about irrelevant information. Um, so what I would call here mindless transparency um, is transparency that would fill your research report with irrelevant information that is likely to obstruct an efficient understanding of the research claims. Way back in 1998, Norbert Kerr said something that, that really sort of resonated with me, which is that journal space and reader attention are limited and valuable resources, and research reports neither can nor should be detailed laboratory diaries. Now, I get that we're online now, and I'm fully behind the idea of putting things in supplementary documents. That's all fine. Um, but I think that, in, to answer your question, the most important open science practice is to think carefully about what we're being transparent about and why, right? Um, to be clear, I'm totally in favor of making all data and research materials available regardless of their relevance so that they can be used for other purposes. And I'm in favor of making all results available that are relevant to the research claims, but I'm not in favor of making results available that are totally irrelevant to the research claims. Um, or, or perhaps they would go in a, in a supplementary document, but they, the message, the, you know, I'm concerned that by that our desire for transparency may sometimes lead to an information overload that is um, problematic for scientific communication. Now, and I also understand that, you know, in saying this, what's classed as relevant and irrelevant may be open to bias. You know, I might find a, a finding which I think, ooh, I don't want to share that, so I'll just call it irrelevant and move on. Um, and, and people will do that. That's just the way people work. But I think that open data and research materials can help people to identify and discuss what's relevant and what's not relevant. So I don't see that as being a problematic issue. What I do see is problematic is us not thinking carefully and being too gun ho in our transparency and just saying, look, let's let's vomit out all of this information. Um, and in the, in the repercussion of that is that we get a very big mess where the scientific communication is lost in amongst all of that. So that's my, my thought. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants to answer, ask anything. We're exactly on time at 11. So we can, we can either close it here <laughs> or have one more question. Yeah, OK, people are clapping. I think we will finish here then. So thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope you join us on the next sessions. We have another 13 sessions to go. The next one is on uh, Thursday from Daniel Knuckles that will show us the value of pre-registration. Um, Mudaleni will put the link so you, you see all the sessions coming. And I hope to see you in the other sessions. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Mark and Liz. Thanks. Yes. Bye bye. Okay. Good good night. <laughs>